Hello and welcome to this uh, review of the Battle of the Atlantic by Jonathan Dimbleby. Um, this is just going to be something I'm going to try um, as something to put out on the podcast feed. Um, I'm going to try to kind of review or at least talk about the books that I'm reading. Well, not, not all of them, probably the ones that I at least... Um, like sort of physically read either in physical form or uh, on a kindle it would be a little bit difficult to do or at least i think i think i would find a little bit difficult to do it for a um an audiobook just because it's more difficult to take notes for an audiobook um but taking notes for a physical book is fa fairly straightforward. Um, and so this is the first one I'm going to try to do. This the Battle of the Atlantic. Um, the subtitle is How the Allies Won the War. Um, and I'll be looking at the, the screen just because um, my notes are on there. Um, so the subtitle is How the Allies Won the War. And I think that the first point I wanted to make is that I think the subtitle is somewhat I, want, I don't want to say misleading but I, I don't think it really um, hit what the subtitle is promising it's going to hit I think the point of the subtitle of course is that the battle of the Atlantic if the allies had not I suppose won the battle of the Atlantic they it's difficult to do a counterfactual in history but there's a high chance that the war at least would have dragged on for longer. Um, it wouldn't have finished when it did. Um, but I think that the book doesn't quite manage to um, really hit on why the Battle of the Atlantic um, was a precondition for winning the war. Um, and I don't know if it, it really was. Um, certainly it had to happen but I don't think it was necessarily why the Allies won the war. Um, it's a little bit difficult. I think there's obviously other spheres, um, and while it's, it's, I feel like it's a good history of the Battle of the Atlantic, um, I don't think it, it really did the subtitle justice, at least. Um, but yeah, overall, I think it was a really interesting look at the Battle of the Atlantic. I'm by no means an expert. This is actually the first first book that I've read on the topic. Um, and as an introduction, I thought it was at least interesting. There were some things that I thought were missing that I came away from the book, not sort of, that, that I wish there was more of in there. One of those was the technology. Um, there was kind of a brief sentence in one of the later chapters which said that the reason the allies were able to win the war was the sort of coordinated use of the technology including things like the radar um, modern aircraft um, and um, the Aztecs that were fitted to the ships um, and then um, the, the directional um, radio what, what was called Huff Duff um, it was a coordinated use of that among both the British and the Americans, which was eventually able to close the Atlantic Gap um, and defeat the U-boats. But it was like a passing sentence, and then you have a couple of pages worth of an example of a, a convoy in which the protection was successfully sort of put together using this combination um, of technology and planes and ships. But beyond that, there wasn't really that much information on that. And I think that he explicitly says it's a very important part of why the Allies were able to win the Battle of the Atlantic, but didn't really get any information about it. Um, and although on, on the positive side, there was this, this, the personal stories were kind of a real strong point. I think the the chapters were kind of split half half as like sort of talking about the grand strategy 
uh, side of the Battle of, of the Atlantic. So you were sort of going into like the war cabinet meetings or meetings between Churchill and Roosevelt um, or the letters that were sent between them and some of the sort of considerations that were taking place on that bigger scale. The other side of the, or the, the, the other part of the chapter was then sort of zooming in on a convoy or a ship and talking about sort of the experiences within um, like the personal experience that people were having. And I thought that that was the real strong part of the book. Um, one of the sort of um, parts where it really jumps out was in chapter six. Um, you got some testimony to what it was like on the small um, ships that would escort the convoys across the Atlantic. Um, these were very, very small ships. They were called corvettes. Um, and here's one that I, I just pulled out. Um, I, unfortunately, I, in my highlights, I don't have who this qu is quoting. It says here, Well, I think we were all going through the same sort of thing. We were in the same sort of danger. You were in it together. There was no running away from it, was there? You were there, and you had to get on with it. On bigger ships, you have a great deal more bullshit. But there was the way the Corvettes were, very special. It was a family and it ran itself. I think the magic of the flower class Corvette is at its small, a very close-knit company of crew, of a crew, and everyone of you have shared the same experiences, the same feelings. It was a family affair. And then it goes on, I've got a couple of quotes here that I think are worth reading about what it was like during a storm because it, at the beginning of 1941, I think it then at the beginning of 1943 as well, there were quite bad Atlantic storms. Um, and this was just, it, it sounds horrible. Um, here's another quote. I think it's the same person who quoted before. Um, 500 miles in six days of screaming wind and massed tumbling water, of sleet and snowstorms, of a sort of frozen malice in the weather which refused us all progress. Nothing could keep it out. Helmets, mittens, duffel coats, sea boots, stockings, all were like so much tissue paper. Cold, said the signalman, as he pulled his hand away from the morse lamp and left a patch of skin on the handle. Cold? I reckon this would freeze the ears of a brass monkey. Icy water finds its way everywhere. Neck, wrists, trouser legs, boots. One stands out there like a sodden automaton, ducking behind every rail as every other wave sends spray flying over the compass house, and then standing up to face with eyes that feel raw and salt cakes and streaming the wind and rain and treachery of the sea. Apart from the noise it produces, Rolling has a maddening rhythm that is one of the minor tortures of rough weather. It never stops or misses a beat. It cannot be escaped anywhere. If you go through a doorway, it hits you hard. If you sit down, you fall over. You get hurt, knocked, and continuously. And it makes for, a stream and ch for an extreme and childish anger. When you drink, the liquid rises towards you and slops over. At meals, the food spills off your plate and cutlery will not stay in place. Things roll about and bang and slide away crazily and then come back and hurt you again. The wind doesn't howl, it screams at you and tears at your clothes and throws you against things and drives your breath down your throat again. Sometimes at the worst height of a gale, you may be hove to in the source of fury for days on end. And all the time, you can't forget that you are no nearer shelter than you were 24 hours before. And I think it's this experience that um, you get. We've got sort of a lot of writing about what it was like to fight uh, on the front lines in the war. But we don't have a lot of um, first-hand accounts like this of what happened in the Battle of the Atlantic. I think it's... Part of the reason it hasn't entered sort of the psyche of what the Second World War was is because we don't have these first-hand accounts. He goes at the end um, of the book and sort of talks about some of the people who did survive the war. And it's, it's very few compared to the number of people who 
actually falls. I think one of the stats he gives is the German U-boat sailors. The, the, the statistic was like something like four out of five of them were killed during the war. Um, and so you just don't have first-hand accounts of these people. The one first-hand account you do have is a guy called Peter Kremer. Um, he was one of these U-boat commanders that would survive the war and wrote a memoir. Um, and here he he writes um, about what it was like being in a uh, U-boat during one of these storms. He says, as far as the eye could see, there were only rolling hills with strips of foam cursing down their sides like veins in marble. On the surface of the U on the surface, the U-boat literally climbed the mountainous seas, plunging through the wave crest, hung for a moment with its stern in the empty air and plunged down the other side into the trough of waves. When it buried its nose, the screws in the stern seemed to be revolving in air, striking up in front against the conning tower and from behind into the open bridge screen. The seas smothered us and we had to shut the conning tower hatch for a while to prevent foundering. With the seas crashing down on U-333's deck like an avalanche, he felt as though his crew were whirling about in a dice cup. It was impossible to form any useful function, impossible to prepare food, and impossible to sleep in hammocks which swayed to and fro like washing hung to dry. On the occasion, despite the distracting tempest, Kramer managed to detect a tanker a mere 3,000 metres away. In quieter conditions, this would have been easy prey. But with the wind at force 10, the tanker was at one moment on the top of a mountainous wave and at the next had disappeared into the valley. An attack was out of the question, though he attempted to keep station with the vessel, which escaped into the night. The same thing happened the next day and the next day after that. When the conditions became unendurable, Kremer ordered all hands to diving stations. U-333's wild gyrations eased, but the turmoil of the ocean ran so deep that the only way to absolutely escape the misery of the dice cup was to go down until they were at least 50 meters beneath the surface. At this level, U-333 lay quite still. The cook brought a delicious smelling stew to the table, and everyone fell too. Eat and sleep, hear nothing, see nothing. When the storm eased, the hunting and the killing began again and so th this was the strong point of the book and unfortunately it only really ran early in the book um, I think towards the end things were heating up he was sort of focusing more on the, the higher levels um, you could say of what was going on and so you don't get as many of those, those personal accounts um, in terms of the things that the book does talk about, um, there is this sort of constant battle between the the air um, air slash land forces, both in Germany and in um, Britain, uh, the sort of fight for resources. And I think that it it's. Um, had there been a little bit more attention paid to specifically just that, it might have been a stronger book. Um, I think that effectively in in Britain you had the well, the bomber command um, sort of fighting it out with the admiralty uh, about who would get the um, l very long range bombers. Um, the admiralty wanted them because they would be allowed they would allow um, most of the Atlantic to be um, covered um, using air cover and that would make the U-boats effectively useless. Um, what Bomber Command wanted them so that they, they could go and bomb uh, Germany. And for most of the war, the propaganda effects of, at least the morale effects of um, bombing Germany were were higher. And so they felt that the war cabinet effectively fell on Churchill would feel that um, having the uh, the very long range bombers assigned to bomber command w would be better 
Um, and there was also sort of a little bit of interesting discussion about whether the bombing of U-boats was an offensive or defensive uh, thing to do, um, which Dimbleby pushes back on a little bit and says that it's kind of a, a false idea um it's a false dichotomy the 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 bombing of u-boats was while it was seen as defensive it wasn't really um it was the prosecution of this war that had to be won to beat germany this battle that had to be won sorry to beat germany um it wasn't just the defense of of the merchant ships that were crossing the atlantic um and when churchill comes around to that and they do put the Liberator bombers into the Atlantic, it changes the course of the war entirely. Um, and so what you've got is on both sides, in, in Germany you had um, Admiral Dönitz, who was, was the U-boat commander. Um, he would later be uh, convicted of war crimes for... Actually, he wasn't convicted of war crimes for the sort of unlimited submarine warfare which he had launched in the Atlantic, um, basically because the U.S. Um, I don't know what position he held, but U.S. Uh, U.S.'s Chester Nimitz would admit that he had also sort of used unrestricted submarine warfare in the Pacific, um, and so R Dönitz was never sort of convicted of that war crime, but he was convicted of war crimes after the war and um, put in Spandau prison. Um, but he was in command of the U-boats, um, and above him was Admiral uh, Raider, uh, Eric Raider, um, who, who was the head of the Kriegsmarine, the, the German Navy. Um, and there was an interplay between Dönitz and Raider as to how uh, the various um, how how the how many U-boats should be built and how much how many resources should effectively be put towards building the uh, the U-boats versus building like a surface fleet um, and Dönitz sort of never got over the fact that Raider was kind of romanticized um, with the idea of the surface fleet. Um, he built several battleships, which had become kind of obsolete after the First World War um, when submarines were used. But he built several battleships, and you get the story of the Bismarck, which effectively it entered, it was trying to break out into the Atlantic. It had been launched in sort of the Arctic. Um, it was trying to break out into the Atlantic where they the Allies were really worried that it, it was going to cause havoc. And it never managed to break out. They had managed to sort of damage it in an in a, um, engagement. And then it was trying to get to the Bay of Biscay where it was bombed and eventually sunk. Um, and it never, never was used. And then you had the Tirpitz, which caused some consternation within the Arctic um, and I'll get to that in a minute, but um, it had caused some consternation in the Arctic, some fear in the Arctic that it would be used there, and also was just never used. And so Dernus never gets over this. And so both sides aren't committing enough to the, the Atlantic theatre, and because of that, they both sides fail um, to sort of end that battle early enough. Um, and then you sort of get an idea of the relationship between Roosevelt and Churchill, specifically as it relates to the Atlantic. Obviously, that's a topic that can be expanded massively. Um, there are books out there on that relationship. Um, but what you do see is, I think, fairly surface level, um, where Churchill was trying to get Roosevelt to commit to entering the war um, and then commit to sort of putting resources towards the fight against Germany and not against Japan. Um, and then you get a really interesting discussion about the relationship between the Allies and Russia um, in 
insofar as the opening of the second front in Europe is concerned, um, which isn't really related to the Battle of the Atlantic, which is a little bit frustrating that it was at. Um, it's a little bit frustrated that, frustrating that they spend so much time talking about it. There was a couple of chapters which are all sort of focused on the battle in North Africa and the battle in the Mediterranean. Um, and yeah, that was just a little bit frustrating. Um, I sort of had to gloss over those because I wanted to find out more about how the battle in the Atlantic was finished. Um, so I'll just finish off this with some sort of good points and some bad points, or some weak points, I could say. Good points is that I think it did manage to blend the macro, like the, the macro grand strategy and the micro fairly well. Um, the macro side did spend a little bit too much time, as I said, speaking about the relationship with Stalin. I, did, I didn't think that was totally necessary to understanding what was happening in the Atlantic. Um, and the, the chapters that spent that were spent talking about that were a little bit not boring, but just sort of off, off point, off topic. Um, some of the weaker points, I think, it was difficult to follow the timeline. Um, it's not written chronologically, well, it is um, sort of, but not perfectly. So, like chapter fifteen occurs after chapter one. But within there, you get some jumping around in the timeline, and just the the style of prose that's used, it can be you can get a little bit lost at where in the timeline you are, and you have to sort of go back a fair bit to find where a date is written, and then sort of piece it together. Um, that was a little bit difficult um, to sort of follow where in the timeline you were. It was not the end of the world, but there was that frustration um, and then as I said I was hoping to get a little bit more of the technical information um, talking about sort of how the warfare I think it would have really done well with like a chapter near the beginning talking about why submarines are so dangerous to merchant convoys um, and to surface fleets um, and what the situation was at the beginning of the war and then spending at least when the major um, developments happened with radar and um, different sort of weapons that were able to be used inserting that into the, the narrative rather than sort of having a summary um, I think that was that probably could have replaced the stuff about Russia in my in my opinion um, but that's really, really all I've got. So, um, I don't know if this really is helpful. I really enjoyed the book. Um, I don't know if I'll pick up anything more by Dimbleby. I've read a few reviews on his other books and I think that there's other things that I'll read first. I'm, I may pick up his book on Russia, um, but I thought it was, it was a really interesting book. Um, and it's not too long either. Um, I read it in about a week. Um, and so it, it, was, it was quite quite a good one. Um, so thank you for tuning in, and um, I'll see you when I do another one of these.